the fiery aftermath of a Bombardier Challenger 604 jet operated by Hopajet Charter Jet Services was captured on video when this jet apparently suffered a dual engine failure while on a right base entry for runway 23 at Florida's Naples Airport. Miraculously, the three passengers on board this aircraft safely evacuated the aircraft. Unfortunately, it appears that both crew members on board this aircraft were fatally injured. It's Saturday the 10th of February. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. Here's what we know so far about this accident. Starting first with the Aviation Safety Network. Friday the 9th of February, Bombardier CL600 Challenger 604 operated by East Shore Aviation as Hopajet, November 823 Kilo Delta, two fatalities, five occupants, aircraft destroyed, five kilometers northeast of the Naples, Florida airport. Hopajet Flight 823 of Bombardier CL600 Challenger 604 was destroyed in a forced landing on the I-75 at mile marker 107, five kilometers northeast of the airport. Two of the five occupants perished. That would be the pilot and co-pilot at this time. The aircraft was on approach to Naples, uh, Florida airport. It'd be runway 23, right base entry. When the crew radioed that they'd lost both engines and were not able to make it to the runway. The aircraft struck a truck during the landing and burst into flames as it came to rest against a concrete wall at the side of the southbound lanes. The condition of the people in the truck that was struck is unknown at this time. Victor over here at Bass Aviation has captured the ATC audio from Naples Tower. We don't have any of the ATC audio preceding this audio clip, and he's uh, done a GPS overlay. Hopper Jet 823 is with you on a right downwind for a five mile final, uh, runway 23. Hopper Jet 823, Roger, make the right turn back towards the airport. Police one departure ahead, Challenger Jet, runway 23, clear to land, wind 22012, gust 16. All right, Challenger Jet departing. We're turning back towards the airport and clear to land runway 23, Hopper Jet 823. The weather's good. The winds are down the runway. No sound or indication of any distress from the pilot. No indication of any fuel status or problems with the engine at this point. Hopper Jet 574, runway 23, turn right heading 270, clear for takeoff, traffic three mile final, Challenger Jet. Question 574, Okay, uh, Challenger uh, Hopper Jet 823. Lost both engines, emergency. I'm making an emergency landing. Service, got the emergency, clear to land, runway 23. Is that Hopajet 823? Uh, we're clear to land, but we're not going to make the runway. Uh, we've lost both engines. Drop by 574 to hold short. Tower Shadow 5, we're dead. Shadow 5, there are two northwest right over I 75. Hopajet 823. Uh, Everybody stand by. There's an alert three in progress. Everybody stand by. Tower Shadow 5 rescue helicopter requested to go to the station. Shadow 5, proceed direct as requested. Shadow 5, 574, Naples Tower, runway 23, turn right heading 270. Clip takeoff. Reflected 574. Departure heading is 270, clip takeoff. ATC audio courtesy of liveatc.net. If we look at the flight history of this particular jet on Friday, the aircraft departed the home base of Hopajet, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and headed up to the Ohio State University Airport, about a two hour and tw 22 minute flight to the north. After about one hour on the ground, the aircraft returned to Naples Airport for a two hour and um, 10 minute flight back to Naples. One of the many things that investigators will be looking at is fuel on board the aircraft and did the aircraft take on any fuel at the Ohio State University Airport. If we look at the last couple of ADSB data points here on um, Airplanes Live, starting on the right base entry, we're at 162 knots and 1800 feet. And here slowing to 155 knots, just 256 feet per minute down. 129 knots at 1,600 feet and 896 feet per minute down. Apparently, they've already lost their engines. Here they are at 1,100 feet 
uh, with a rate of descent of 2,000 feet per minute, 1,400 foot per minute rate of descent, 1,100 foot per minute rate of descent, 115 knots, 1,400 foot per minute rate of descent, 113 knots, and 111 knots and 1,400 feet per minute rate of descent at the last data point. If we take that KML data and upload it to Google Earth, we can take a look at it a little closer here. And that puts the aircraft on I-75 right about in this location right here. Looks like it slid all the way down to about here. Here on Google Maps, here's the Naples Airport, runway 23. Here's I-75 and the southbound lanes. Here's the Windermere Golf Course. And that would put this aircraft somewhere right about in here. Let's take a look from the northbound lanes. And unfortunately, it appears that the right wing struck this acoustic barrier wall in the southbound lanes, spinning the aircraft around to the right with the nose of the aircraft impacting the wall, which is probably what killed the pilots. And the aircraft spun around 180 degrees to its final resting place, allowing the passengers to safely escape. Again, from this video clip provided by Kyle Cavalier on X, we can see the right wing tip of the jet missing and a major impact on the acoustic wall right here and the three passengers safely escaping the aircraft. Hoppajet is a FAR Part 135 aircraft charter operation that's been in existence for over 40 years. Remember the three basic different levels of FAA distinction between these different types of operations. FAR Part 91 is general aviation that all of us that own private airplanes operate under. FAR Part 135 is for charter operation, charter for hire. You charter the entire jet to uh, go somewhere or part FAR Part 121, airline operations, where you just buy a seat ticket. Hoppa Jet Aircraft Charter was started in 1977 by Harry Hopp, a World War II pilot. Hopp passed away in 1999 at the age of 82, and now the company president is Barry Ellis. Hoppa Jet has a fairly extensive fleet of luxury jet aircraft, including the Challenger 604. This is the aircraft that was involved in the accident, November 823 Kilo Delta. Again, you rent the entire aircraft and crew for your charter activities. And here on the website, it lists the range of this aircraft as 3,800 miles. A flight up to Ohio State University and back would be well within the reach of this aircraft, not without refueling. Here on Sky Vector, it looks like the entire round trip for this was 1,680 miles. And the idea at the end of this landing, at the end of this trip at Naples, was to return the aircraft right back over here to Fort Lauderdale. Besides this most recent accident, Hoppajet has two other incidents here on the Aviation Safety Network. Uh, back in 2004, Learjet 55, where the pilot elected to go around in bad weather in hydroplaning conditions after he had deployed the thrust reversers, something you're not supposed to do once you deploy the thrust reversers you are committed to landing and went off the end of the runway no fatalities back in 1999 a hoppa jet challenger 600 ran off the side of the runway at fort lauderdale no injuries but it was back in march of last year that this very close call by a hoppa jet learjet that took off without permission to take off at boston's logan airport this screen grab was captured by a jump seater in the JetBlue aircraft that was landing at the time that this Hoppajet Learjet scooted past him on an intersecting runway. When the Hoppajet aircraft was cleared to line up and wait, but not cleared for takeoff. And according to the report there, the young 23-year-old co-pilot working with a 60-plus-year-old captain, the captain heard that he was cleared for takeoff in a Tenerife style uh, bit of poor crew resource management, the, the young co-pilot did not question the captain's, what the captain heard as far as cleared for takeoff. And 
they, they allow that aircraft to go ahead and take off in front of the landing jet blue aircraft. A very close call. I remember the captain of the Hoppa jet said he was suffering from a stuffed nose, um, maybe a little bit of fatigue and the cold weather at Boston. He's not sure why he took off when he wasn't cleared to, and he apologized. The Challenger 600 series of jet has a pretty good safety record. There's about nine fatal accidents on here. One of the most recent ones was the fatal circling to land accident here in Truckee, California that was covered extensively on this channel. Most all of these other fatal accidents were all based on a pilot error and one of them was an aircraft that was shot down by the Venezuelan Air Force, a drug running airplane. So a dual engine failure on a jet engine is an extremely rare event with the exception of Sully and um, the loss of his aircraft in the Hudson River, which was attributable to a massive bird strike. There's no mention of birds at this point in the accident investigation, but NTSB will be uncovering everything in order to figure this out, including the past maintenance history on this aircraft. And they'll also be studying closely the fuel system on board the Challenger 604. So the Challenger 604 has a relatively complicated fuel system but it makes it it appears to me i'm not a bombardier pilot but it appears to me that it, this relatively complicated engineered fuel system makes the pilot's job very easy on this aircraft as it's mostly handled automatically but the aircraft has a left main tank a right main tank and a collector tank right here in the middle that the main tanks feed into it also has three auxiliary tanks shown in green. These auxiliary tanks feed into the main tanks, which then feed into the collector tank and then to the engines. Some models of aircraft, I'm not sure if this is on all models of the aircraft, have um, a tail tank system shown in red as well. Now, like most fuel systems on jet aircraft, you want to burn the fuel in the middle of the aircraft first to reduce the bending moment on the wings. So the fuel management on the 604 is mostly automatic. Fuel is burned from the main tanks until they reach 93% of their capacity. So they're just burned down a little bit. Then fuel transfer commences from the aux fuel tanks. Those are the green tanks in the middle of the air aircraft to the main tanks. Float valves in the main tanks regulate this fuel transfer and maintain the tanks at 93% capacity until the aux tank system and tail tank system are depleted. So that sounds like that's all done automatically. But as a crew member, you need to carefully manage and monitor your fuel all the time. And here's an example of our uh, fuel monitoring on our recent flight out of Sydney. And we're checking the fuel at every single waypoint against the flight plan fuel. And we're constantly looking for a trapped fuel or fuel leaks or a fuel indicator problem. Because when you're out in the middle of the Atlantic, or correction, when you're out in the middle of the South Pacific, Atlantic if you're going to London, you don't have a lot of options. So you need to catch a fuel system problem early by properly monitoring the fuel system at every single waypoint. So the two collector tanks located at the lowest point in the center auxiliary fuel tank are considered part of the main tank system. And they receive their fuel from the respective main wing tanks via gravity or a scavenge ejector, ejector pump flow. Fuel from the collector tanks is supplied to the engine driven pump by main ejector pumps or an electric boost pump. So the engines are primarily driven by the engine driven fuel pumps like any aircraft design and are backed up with boost pumps. During normal operations, we're talking about this fuel boost pump panel right here. During normal operation, the only pilot action required is to arm both boost pump switches on the fuel control panel prior to engine startup and disarm them after shutdown. And then when the boost pumps are armed, the boost pumps will activate if low pressure is sensed. And again, these boost pumps are used for engine starting and as a backup fuel feed source if either the main ejector pump output pressure is too low to sa satisfactorily feed its respective engine. Here's how these ejector pumps work using Bernoulli's principle. They draw fuel up from the bottom of the tank using motive flow from the engine driven pump here, which blows fuel through this venturi, which in turn sucks the fuel up out of the tank and feeds the engine. So investigators will be looking very closely at this fuel system, see if there's any data on board the aircraft that can help them solve this accident. They'll also be looking at all the fuel itself, the amount of fuel, the filters, uh, 
any fuel that was received recently, any additives that were added or not added to the fuel recently, all in an effort to try to find out what caused this very rare dual engine flame out or failure. Another common thing that pilots can do to induce a dual engine failure is you start with one engine failure and with a lack of crew resource management, end up shutting down the wrong engine or the remaining good engine. If we don't have a cockpit voice recorder on this accident, we may never get to the bottom of that one. So investigators will be looking at everything to try to determine what caused this dual engine failure. Based on the post-crash fire, it seems to me that there was still fuel on board the aircraft, and these three passengers are extremely lucky to be able to survive this crash landing. This jet weighs 26,000 pounds empty and has a maximum gross weight of 38,000 pounds to do a forced landing on a freeway and survive that. They are very, very lucky. Thank you so much for your support of this channel, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. As we get more information, we'll let you know. See you here. Is there anybody else in there? Are they alive? Yeah, they're alive. They're alive.